All right, for chapter three in OpenStax Astronomy, these particular set of lecture videos are only going to be talking about two sections in detail. Um, so section 3.1 is this video. We're going to be talking about the laws of planetary motion that Johannes Kepler put together. And then the other video that we have um, focuses on section 3.3, Newton's universal law of gravitation, though it does have some statements and comments from the remaining sections of the book. Certainly you can read the other sections on your own if you're interested, but we're focusing our lecture videos um, on this chapter on just two of those sections. Okay, so while Galileo was in Italy exploring physics in his workshop, in Denmark we had a nobleman named Tycho Brahe who was surveying the sky. Now we're talking about the mid to late 1500s, no one has invented a telescope yet, and so Tycho Brahe is using um, instruments that don't allow him to um, see better um, than his eyes can, but do allow him to measure distances and angles extremely accurately. So being able to know exactly where things are relative to the horizon and relative to each other. And he would go out and he would survey the sky almost every single night. And so he became very familiar with the patterns of stars um, visible to him. And so one evening in 1572, he found a brand new star in the sky. And it was very exciting for him. He told the government about it. They were very excited for him too. And they gave him lots of funds for an observatory. But the problem is that star that he found faded away after a couple of weeks. What he actually saw was a supernova. We will be talking about those much later in the semester. Um, it's a single explosion of a massive star. And so Tycho's star wasn't really a star at all. And yet he got to have a um, really decked out observatory and highly accurate instruments. Again, not telescopes, but angle measurements. And he kept track of the planets and the sun and the moon and star catalogs, lots and lots of things. And he loved doing it, but what he didn't enjoy doing was the math behind it. He was doing all of this for fun, not as a job, and so he didn't want to do the difficult math analysis. That's a different set of skills. And so he hired Johannes Kepler instead um, to do that for him. Now, Tycho Brahe is a pretty interesting character. You can read up on his life, and there's some really uh, interesting aspects um, to his personality. And he got in a duel once and got his nose cut off. So if you're ever at um, a trivia night and someone asks you which astronomer had a brass nose, it is Tycho Brahe. Um, but one of the biggest things that he was known for was being really paranoid that someone else would get credit for his work. And so Brahe, although he hired Kepler, he kept most of the, the data secret into himself and gave Kepler just small pieces that he wanted a specific analysis done for. And it was only after Brahe died somewhat unexpectedly that Kepler was able to do a full mathematical analysis on the locations of all of the planets, extremely extensive data um, that he was able to find patterns in that data. And so Kepler's analysis, although he didn't understand why he was seeing the patterns that he was seeing, did allow him to write down three laws of planetary motion that are still accurate and useful to us today. Now, in order for us to be able to talk about Kepler's laws of motion, we actually need to introduce a shape called an ellipse. Now, if we think back to the ancient Greek um, slides that we had, where we talked about the two big fundamental things that the ancient Greeks knew to be obviously true, is that the Earth is at the center of everything, and Copernicus and Galileo fixed that understanding, and that everything moved in perfect circles. And finally, with Kepler, we're able to get rid of that other incorrect understanding. Kepler was able to use ellipses to perfectly capture the location of the planets, which meant that we didn't need circles and circles and circles, those epicycles that we talked about from chapter two. Instead, we just need a single ellipse. Now, a um, something that you may have seen in a math class before and may not have is what's called um, conic sections. So if we imagine that we had an upside down ice cream cone and we have the ability to cut it anywhere on that cone and at any angle, if we cut perfectly flat across, we would get a circle. Small circle near the top, big circle near the bottom. If we cut at an angle but are able to cut through the entire um, cone, we get an ellipse shape. And it's got some really specific um, aspects to it. 
If we cut too sharply, we will get a shape that is not fully closed. We can get a parabola or a hyperbola. And when we're talking about orbits in this, um, in this chapter, we don't worry so much about those two shapes because they aren't closed orbits. We won't get that thing back if we put it on a parabolic trajectory. Now, unlike a circle, an ellipse does not have a single central point. On these two diagrams here with the person drawing the ellipse, that red point, although it seems like it's in the circle, uh, in the center, it is closer to the top and the bottom of that picture than it is to the left and the right. It is not a true center point. Instead, the two silver tacks that have been placed into this paper that the person is using to, to draw with a string, those two tacks are both um, special points called a focus point. The plur plural of focus is foci. And so a circle has a single central point, an ellipse has two focus points, or foci. And a circle has a single radius that can describe how big or small that circle is. An ellipse has a long radius, the semi-major axis, and a short radius called the semi-minor axis. That's drawn with A here um, in the far right picture. Now, Kepler's first law states that each planet moves around the sun in an orbit that is an ellipse with the sun at one focus, which means that, okay, we've decided that the um, planets are ellipse um, orbits and not circles, and the sun is at one of those two special points and not just anywhere inside that shape. Straightforward enough um, once we start to understand these new terms with ellipses. Kepler's second law is by far the most complex to understand in everyday language. Remember, Kepler is a mathematician, and so he says things the way a mathematician would. Kepler's second law states that the straight line joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas in space in equal intervals of time. Now let's think about what that actually means. If we think about this blue ellipse shape as the orbit of, um, let's say, a comet around the sun, at position one compared to position two, maybe that takes one month of time for this comet or asteroid or whatever it is, or a planet. From position one to position two, let's say that that's a month worth of time. That shaded in area B, we could count up the number of pixels that is involved in that yellow shaded area, and that would be a certain number of pixels. It would be a certain area. On the other side of the ellipse, far away from the sun, from position three to position four, that comet or asteroid or planet also takes a month to go from uh, position three to position four. And that section labeled A, the number of pixels over there is the same amount. It's the same area. We see that rather than a wide um, and short triangle, we have a long and narrow triangle, but the area is the same. Now, equal areas and equal time is now what that picture is trying to show us. Let's take a step back and think about what that means for how fast this planet is going. Near the sun, it goes through this huge amount of distance in a very short period of time, that one month. So that big distance in a month means it's going very fast. And over there, that small distance in the same month means it's going slower. So worth writing into our notes, the rephrased version of Kepler's second law is that planets move faster when they are near the sun. They are fast when they are near the sun. And they are moving slower in their orbit when they are far from the sun. That's what Kepler's second law is trying to tell us. I, I will have a second um, video with me on a, um, on a light board to help us think through some of these. But it is worth us understanding that we can rephrase Kepler's second law into much more meaningful language. That a planet is moving fastest when it is close to the sun and it is moving slowest when it is far from the sun. Kepler's third law is the most mathematical, and it's the one that we're not really going to use in our um, curriculum. But it says the square of a planet's orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. 
So P, the orbital period, represents how long it takes to make a complete circle, or ellipse, rather. And A is the way that we describe the size of an ellipse. It's not quite the radius, but it's similar to the radius. It's the distance, kind of, in a way, the average distance between the planet and the sun. What this tells us is planets that are close, if they have a small number for A, they also go fast around the sun. They are taking less time to go around the sun. They have a smaller number for P. And so Kepler's third law is basically the same overall big picture idea to the second law, that planets close to the sun are going quickly, planets far from the sun are going slower. Kepler's second law, the one before, was talking about two different points for a single orbit, a single object. And Kepler's third law is comparing two separate objects. But fundamentally, they both tell us that the planets that go close to the sun are moving quickly. We'll eventually learn that that's because the gravity is stronger at that point. And planets that are far from the sun go slower, and that's because the gravity is weaker at that point. Kepler's laws of planetary motion have stood up to all of the scientific evidence over the past 500 years, putting them not just at simple ideas or hypotheses, but at this level of theory or kind of accepted as being proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And so even though he didn't understand why the planets acted this way, he did show successfully that they did. The ideas within Kepler's laws are really important, but they can also be very difficult, very mathematical in nature. And so we will have further activities, um, different animations, like I said, that um, extra video of me at a light board, um, and worksheets to practice these ideas. And just like before, there are a couple of um, common supplemental workbooks that have some um, useful diagrams uh, or useful activities uh, if you have these workbooks or are using them. So the next video that we have will be talking about Isaac Newton and basically the understanding of why the planets are acting the way that Kepler figured they um, did. Uh, and that will be the end of our chapter three discussion in that second video. So I will see you in that one.